or a fellow legislator's perspective, we could just get a, a quick overview of the thinking and where the house is, and then we'll go to David Hall and do a walkthrough of the bill, and then we'll start opening up for our witnesses and discussions. But I'd like to like hear from Tom for maybe five minutes and then David for 10, and then hear from uh, witnesses, including the administration on this. Oh, you switched boxes on me, Tom, hi. <laughs> hey, well, I, I, I decided to block myself uh, out okay. until we got to this point, so. Okay, so take um, it away, Tom. Thank you very much for all you've been doing over there. Yeah, well. Um, Right. No, thank you. Thank you for for having me in, and I I'm gonna do this and then duck out because everybody here is gonna um, be able to answer the questions far better than I am. Um, we did this uh, as everybody knows on the 12th or so of March. The House anyway was given the directive to start working on a COVID response for uh, areas in our portfolio, and of course it came up very quickly that the three things that are in 11.1 were the first things that came and it became the most important things to come out of our committee and they and they do go hand in hand with some of the COVID response that came out of commerce uh, in other committees but um, basically there's three parts in the bill as it stands and uh, the first part is about family leave the second part is about homelessness mitigation and the third part is about uh, rental evictions and i think the strongest work in the bill right now is in the rental evictions this was a longish process um, of trying to get the language right we had the parameters as early as march 13th about what we wanted to do but as we all know with eviction processes are not just simply saying um you can't do you can't evict there have to be many many uh, nuances dealt with and what is truly impressive over the last couple of weeks while it's not um while it was pretty tedious at times in terms of the language uh, and, and doing it in a zoom setting or in a phone setting uh, rather than face to face uh, the work that was done between vermont legal aid and vermont landlord association uh, the judiciary the advocates um early on vhcb was a was a heavy participant um, early on, we talked to AHS and, and DCF about some of the aspects of the homelessness mitigation, a lot of which has been done, but now there's the issue of funding, ongoing capacity issues. So what you're going to be looking at is, is, is the result of that work. Again, I think the most important piece of it is going to be the rental eviction, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, ignore the other pieces right now as well. The, our committee... I sent an email to Senator Clarkson and Senator Sorokin last night just with a quick uh, update of how our committee has left this. Uh, given that the Senate is in a, in a closer place to passing bills, it's, we, we're fine with taking you taking this language and, and working on it and passing it back to us to finish up. Um, our committee was pretty exhausted by the end of yesterday in talking about this simply because of the the details that went into it and getting and getting this eviction protection uh, process right as right as we could possibly get it and so i'm hoping that when you look at it you'll also take a look at um for instance the um there is a number associated with an appropriation in terms of the homelessness mitigation by the end of yesterday we felt like that language was we weren't comfortable necessarily putting that into a finished bill at this time but that's something for you to consider that, you know, without knowing how much federal money is coming and how much money might be available in our general fund, we thought that just simply implying that, and this is not in the bill, this is just in the message that I sent, which was saying that um, we were comfortable with pur purveying the message that uh, to the extent that funds are available, we would like to see this funding go to DCF so that it can address these purposes that are in the bill. Um, in terms of the family leave portion, we think we can handle that or, or address that after this set after this particular portion of the bill is passed um i think that's something that we'll see as an ongoing need rather than an immediate need so that's really um it was it, it was good to hear from the senate last week and 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 try to work together in a way that we haven't worked with try to expedite this i think the stakeholders have all emphasized how important it is to get a statewide 
program in place when it comes to addressing eviction protections um, and not just eviction protections, but also everything that goes along with it. We don't want to put landlords out of business. We don't want to put people on streets, you know, and, and, and that was the that was the problem we had to solve here through our existing legal system. And so this is session law. This isn't changing anything in the underlying statute. This is all in response to the COVID crisis. And, um, you know, I hope you guys, I expect you guys to do good work on it. And, you know, David, David has worked um, hand in hand with the advocates to get the language right. And again, I, everybody who's um, here, Judge Gerson, um, Jean Murray and, and Angela have all been, um, have all been in our committee testifying this week on the bill. So I think you'll find that there's some unanimity in the language. Um, there may be some questions about, are, is there gonna be more to be put forward? But again, that's up to you guys to, to determine. So I appreciate the opportunity to fill you in, answer, I'll be happy to answer any questions before you get to David. Um, and if not, um, then I'll take off. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm looking on our web page and the last document I see, I think from David Hall is draft 8.1. Am I missing no, something? I thought Faith and Denise were posting 11.1. Uh, oh, I, I see it now. I see it now. It's under Damien Thank Leonard. You. It's under Damien yeah. Leonard. It probably should be under David Hall. It should be under David and it, yeah. Okay. David, well, Damien was the initial attorney on this and he did the, um, he did the work. Part. He did the first draft on this, and then when it went started to go further, David, of course, came in to to lend his expertise to the um, to the rental housing portion of it. The other thing that did not get handled in this bill, because um, and this is the interesting part between uh, while you are our sister committee on many issues, you are also the sister committee to commerce. And one of the issues that came up in this conversation that I don't think is fully addressed here is the aspect of commercial rent. Right. Um, and so that's just something to leave out there. We felt comfortable with residential rental processes, not commercial. That's something that uh, the Bankers Association will probably be able to um, give you good information on about what's what's happening in that world. But I, commercial, Commercial leases are not our, uh, in our portfolio. So that portion was not in included in this bill. This is strictly for residential at this point in time. Uh, may, may I just say, uh, Chair, Tom, thank you for that. Uh, we had Betsy Bishop in. It was a little rushed at the end of our meeting and they, are, uh, they may need to be a second bill because they will take more time. If our objective is to get roll this out fast and uh, then I think that that is a separate issue and it's a little it's a very different and it's a very different creature um i would encourage us to think about that and move fast on it but move fast maybe in a separate bill uh for later in the week that's fine i mean this this does this bill does have include this does include language on mortgages um as well and and just i think what's come up too is this notion of of how we're going to, once this bill is put into place of how we're going to message this bill, there have been some concerns raised by um, by folks like VHFA or and, and others who are concerned that people will consider this a rent holiday and that it is clear in the bill that that is not the case. Uh, this is not this is not an opportunity for you to not pay rent if you're able to do so. Um, this is strictly emergency situations if you're unable to do so during during this crisis. And so um, that's a fine line. That's a me that's going to be a messaging thing coming from our le our respective leaderships to make sure that when this bill is put into place that we are um, we are not telling people that they can stop paying rent or stop paying their mortgage. What we're saying is that if they are being negatively affected financially, that there are some protections in place until until things straighten out a little bit. Right. Uh, let me ask you one question. I'll let you go, Tom. Thank you again. Um, the time frame of this moratorium is how long in the bill, and is that where you were originally when you first started talking about it, and has that changed at all? Uh, it has. I mean, we originally, our original uh, work on this said when the emergency is declared over, 
that there would be a period of 60 days where this would still move out the through negotiations again with the stakeholders and they'll be able to clarify as with anything relating to residential statute uh, landlord tenant law it is um there's all these notice requirements is all and when it comes to the writs the number of writs that are being drawn up legally and they'll be able to go through it but we had put a blanket 60 days which got changed in the in the first next draft you know, a, a couple of weeks ago when we started meeting by Zoom um, down to 30 days because people felt that that was sufficient in order to restart the processes. And they've been refined since. And you'll hear that from David and, and the advocates about each particular each particular um, instance has a slightly different time frame to it. So it's not, it's not as simple as saying 60 or 30 days. So, um... We talked about this a little bit at our all Senate meeting, and um, one of uh, a concern that I have is that the situation we're laboring under right now is not ideal, uh, but there is the possibility of further legislation on residential evictions down the road and in the camp of uh, not sure if we've gotten it right or heard from any everybody and all the interplay that happens in a normal legislative process. Um, I think what we're gonna be talking about uh, is how far out we wanna go in this, um, with this bill uh, without further review. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking about and what I've heard is that there is potentially substantial help in the federal law to address these situations that could get at the health problems of people potentially being put out with not, without having an ability to find alternative housing. And as you well know, it's a nightmare out there trying to understand all the ins and outs of the federal law which will become clearer over the next week so um money was a key part of your bill at one point uh I think it's, the, it's the flip side of what we're do, doing here in terms of prevention of the health crisis so we're gonna uh take a look at how far out this bill goes and needs to go knowing that we could pass subsequent uh legislation um, to try and be somewhat more nimble uh, with this. No, uh, if you have I any think that's, thoughts uh, that, uh, that's fine. Uh, I just want to let you know that's one of the thoughts that at least I've, I've been having. No, I think that's fine. I think that's, um, you know, again, by, we put the number in there and back in back in March as a placeholder, because that was when we were doing the back of the envelope math on what it would take to fill the, the hop grants in terms of rental rearages or rental assistance programs that may or may not exist already. You know, it's just, it, it was a, it, it was a real immediate indication of what we thought the size of the problem was going to be, especially in the short term. But the way that this has been uh, managed since then is really, trying to say that there's an emergency period. And during the emergency period, certain things can and can't happen. And then once the emergency period ends, what will happen after that? Um, that's, and so it, it lends itself to being viewed in a longer term, but that's not the money part of it. The money part of it, I mean, it may be in terms of what courts will need eventually down the line or what we'll need for rental arrearages. But I think that, um, the other aspects of this, uh, including the homelessness mitigation, again, at, by the end by the end of yesterday, we didn't feel comfortable. We didn't feel comfortable saying that five million was the number. We're we're not an appropriating committee, but we really want to make sure that that the money that has been appropriated can be used, if it can be used for these purposes, that it is absolutely being spent on these on these needs. And like you said, it's too still too soon. You may know more by Wednesday of next week about how that money can be spent. Um, and that right. would be, that would be ideal. So I, I, you know, at this point, we, we wanted to get you the language, we wanted you to do your work on it and be able to pass it. 
um, because you're again going to be in the position to do that a little bit sooner than we are and um, and certainly we want to be able to get to a point where where when we're able to vote uh, as a as a caucus of the whole that we'll be able to do so on a bill that really it really gets it across it's really become clear as more people have um, become aware of some of the housing issues you know, especially now with the turn of the turn of the month um, where rent is due uh, people are people are nervous about what may happen so um, basically we're just do your work and and then you know stay in touch and we'll we'll continue to work together on it and um, in 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 a way that we really aren't able to do otherwise um, one one final question I promise this time I'll let you go that came up also in our um, in our all Senate meeting was um, do you have a handle or were you working under any assumption as to the numbers of people out there presently who are down the line in terms of writs of possession that are not theoretically protected by the court's administrative order right now? No, um, not in terms of actual numbers. We were concentrating on the numbers that we were concentrating on was trying to get the same rules across 14 counties. First of all, um, you know there have been protections put in place by by uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. There have been protections put in place by HUD uh, oriented properties. But you know, and we're talking about upwards of 65 percent, perhaps or more of, of uh, rental buildings or rental units that are funded in some way by any of those any of those federal programs we don't know that they're we don't know that we're going to miss anybody in those programs and again we don't know everything about those programs yet so we're still talking about at the very least 35 percent of the people who of renters who may be in this boat of potential of of potential um, eviction protections in terms of just buildings that don't have any money that's attached to the federal government or the state government right. in any way. So, um, but no, not in terms of, I mean, I, perhaps the, perhaps the advocates will have a better idea of what they've seen and what they would expect under normal circumstances and then what they might be expecting under these circumstances. But uh, we don't have a, we don't have a number there. We were just concentrating on trying to do something that was statewide rather than, rather than a, a county by a time we saw what happened in Chittenden County where there's there an order was put forward but um, we wanted to make sure that we had the same rules going on across the whole state. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. We appreciate it. Let you go now. All right. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the time. Um, do good work. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, David, Paul, are you there? I'm here. Okay, so I'm having a little trouble on my end pulling up the bill. I mean, I, I have it, but it's frozen let me see if i can try something else um, i'm sharing my screen if it helps any of you right I, I i see it it says you're viewing david hall's screen but i'm not able to scroll at all oh that's well from from my share i'm controlling the uh, he, he's uh, controlling uh, the screen okay well, can you, pulling up well, the bill. my, my <laughs> screen is showing section seven Yes. So is there a way to get to the beginning of the, or is this the part of the bill that we're talking about, only this part? Well, sections one through six deal with the uh, family leave provisions that you okay. worked on. Uh, ah, yeah. that's the answer to the mystery. Okay. Um, why don't you uh, proceed and walk us through what you have? Let me turn off my. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, for the, the record that we're keeping, my name is David Hall. I'm an attorney with the family leave provisions that you okay. worked on. Uh, Sounds like somebody has YouTube on in the background. Uh, why don't you uh, proceed and walk us through? Sorry, Michael, we've sort of lost your audio. I'm I'm here. I just went on to mute. So I'm going to put my, I'll leave my thing on unmuted. But if David could go forward, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you discussed, section seven here 
is the appropriation section. I understand this may come out or it may be modified to remove the number and say something like to the extent funds are available, but um, for now, section seven is a live appropriation in this draft. Section eight is the charge to DCF, DHCD, VHCB and other partners as necessary to uh, administer funding for emergency relief specifically necessitated by the spread of COVID-19. Somebody needs to mute their phone, please. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure. Um, so these, uh, we've looked at these before. I, I don't know, we don't really need to go through them now unless you want to, but these are basically the services that are being performed uh, currently by DCF and the HOP programs. And, um, you know, it just essentially is a, a across the board service for housing search, stability, mediation, follow up, arrearages, security deposits, short term assistance, et cetera. Uh, you know, they're supposed to develop a process criteria. I understand this may also uh, be streamlined to say that they can just use whatever existing protocols they have. You know, there haven't been um, a lot of discussions, frankly, about whether DCF is uh, the right place for this to go, this charge, if it's the right charge, the scope of the services, et cetera. Um, I want to flag those, but I'm, I'm going to move on to the eviction piece unless you have specific questions on Section 8. No, please proceed. Okay. So uh, Section 9 moves on to ejectment and foreclosure actions. And I just I want to note from the very beginning that right now this deals uh, expressly with uh, residential mortgage foreclosures and with evictions. Um, it does not at this point, I think it still needs to be clarified whether this is going to address commercial leases. So if it's going to include that, we need to say so. If it's not, I think we need to say so. Um, right, now, uh, it, right now, it's kind of in a gray area. Um, in subsection A, there's a couple of definitions that go with this piece. The emergency period is the period beginning with this declaration of the state of emergency on March 13th and ending 30 days after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. So that's a defined term in this draft. It is the period of emergency plus 30 days after the governor terminates the state of emergency and he has to do so by declaration to turn this bill off, so to speak. Right, and that, that had changed from the last draft. It was 60 days, wasn't it? I don't know if it was in the last draft at 60, but that 60 is where it started. Right, right, thank you. Um, okay, and the foreclosure is a foreclosure action brought uh, under 12 USA chapter 72, 172 against a dwelling house. If you are going to limit the scope of this just to residential, then I would probably recommend a third definition here, just to say that when you are talking about an ejectment action, you are referring to an action against the residential property under 9 VSA 137 and 12 VSA 169. Um, but I'll leave that to you. So the duties here, you have seen this piece before. It's a little broad, broader um, in its scope. It, the purpose of this subsection B is to explicitly state, you know, duties going forward uh, that are not sort of paused by this bill. So under B1, this, this act would not relieve a tenant of the obligation to pay rent. Under two, this, this would not relieve a tenant in a pending ejectment action of the obligation to pay rent into court pursuant to an existing order under 12 VSA 4853A. So if you've already got that order in and the tenant is paying rent into court under that section, this does not turn that off. They are still ob obligated to continue making those payments pursuant to the order. Under B3, this does not relieve a borrower in a residential loan agreement of the obligation to make timely payments pursuant to the terms of the loan agreement. And then four, this is a piece that was uh, negotiated by the stakeholders extensively. And I think at this point, they're all happy with it. Um, under four, 
It would not limit a court's ability to act in an emergency pursuant to Administrative Order 49 issued by the Supreme Court as amended, including when a landlord terminates a tenancy pursuant to 9 BSA Section 4467B2 based on criminal activity, illegal drug activity, or acts of violence, any of which threaten the health or safety of other residents. So I just like, to, could I put a flag there for further discussion at some point? You know, when we get to discussing it. Well, um, I think we should uh, in some ways take some questions uh, as we go. Um, I think I, I have a question on this section as well. So why don't you go for it? Allison. Okay, um, David, the the one thing that's been raised for me in my neck of the woods is there was a question from a landlord about physical, extreme physical damage to a, 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 an, a an apartment. So I, I suppose we could interpret this as threatening the health and safety, but it limits it all, only to people. Uh, extreme physical damage to a property is also something I'd love to have us at least think about. Sure. So let, let me say um, that subdivision B4 is meant to preserve basically the status quo under AO 49. And right. under that standard, it is in the discretion of the Superior Court to determine what an emergency landlord tenant situation is and whether or not they're going to hear that case or that motion or that whatever, and whether they're going to act on it. That is reserved specifically under this order. Right. And the addition here in lines 13 through 15, again, I think that is to included to expressly say, uh, you know, what is implicit and is already the law, which is um, right. You know, subdivision B2 here, those those bases, criminal activity, drug activity, acts of violence, those are things that could be considered emergency circumstances that a court would hear. But, you know, the function of B4 is not to create some other standard than what the administrative order has. Got, got it. It's just building on it or, and being more explicit in some areas. Okay, fine. So you're saying that the judge could could consider that at any extreme action. Yes. What, right. Okay. I'm fine with that. And it leaves it in the court. You know, I mean, right. you could. This could be. Right. Different. This could be constructed in a way that says, notwithstanding everything going on in this bill, in cases of extreme damage or immediate threat to health, a court shall hear that action immediately. Right. Right. But that's not what this does. Thanks. Okay, so my my question, to see if I can articulate this, is, and Judge Grierson may comment when he testifies on this. Um, presently, as I understand, the emergency power is um, is that there is a uh, moratorium on doing the preliminary eviction filing and in the most commonplace instance, uh, our payment for non uh, payment into court process. And then it becomes from that point uh, forward, it becomes a ministerial act to, to reduce this to by, uh, by the court clerk and then by a sheriff to proceed with the eviction. Uh, the off ramp that the court has on the administrative order is generally um, applicable uh, for a landlord probably uh, to get beyond the administrative order's scope of its moratorium. There are a lot of tenants out there that are unaware of anything we're doing and they're already they're already at a point where they haven't paid their rent and are subject to administrative acts 
going forward and would never think to come and ask the court for an administra- uh, for an emer- emergency relief. Here, what we're doing in this bill is we're saying, okay, there's there are these people out there and we're gonna have to try and find out how many are subject to writs of possession um, without any further court involvement. And we wanna stay those writs of possession uh, in this case. So, uh, um, I guess what I'm asking is that limit the court's ability to act in an emergency pursuant to administrative order. Does that a, does that envision the court stepping in and blocking um, uh, uh, execution of a writ of possession um, uh, already? And is that power? already there and uh does do we already have the ability to stop these evictions going forward both theoretically and practically i don't know if you if you follow that question yeah. or if you can answer it or sure. whether we should wait to judge grierson well i might welcome his insights let me say that this bill i th- i mean if you pass this it goes a step further and it says uh, new general rule moratorium on pending actions, new actions, any orders, any writs, or anything else, period. Everything hits pause when this takes effect and it is unpaused. Some things are going to happen at different times under the different subsections of this bill. But generally, we are hitting the pause button on absolutely everything. And right. so this question becomes, all right, what should be the scope of any exception to that blanket moratorium? And again, pursuant to Senator Clarkson's point and question, you could have said, or you can say, we're going to make exceptions for these circumstances, you know, whatever it happens to be, issue writs already in action, let them keep going, or only we're only going to hear a case if there's damage or health. But it doesn't do that. It says blanket stop on everything. Right. E4 says, except if it's an emergency under AO 49. And so under that order, the courts have said, you know, we're, we're going to hit pause on everything in the court, except for this list of things that we consider to be emergency circumstances. Included among those things is landlord, tenant, emergency, you know, uh, I don't know, procedures, actions, whatever you want to say. It's, it's a one-liner. It's very narrow. And so it's been left to the discretion of each court, each superior court to decide what that's going to look like. And so you have things like Chittenden County, where it's a very extensive uh, limitation for a period of time on what they're willing to hear and what actions they'll take. Other courts haven't done anything yet. And um, so could, could there be the equivalent of a blanket moratorium under the status quo, sure, if every superior court took this approach. But every superior court right now has the authority and the discretion to decide what is an emergency in the landlord-tenant context? What are we going to hear and what are we going to do? Um, and so this would create the general rule, pause everything. And then if you can show that it's an emergency, the courts would still have the ability under B4 to take that on. Is that right? Your question? Okay. Is is Judge Grierson on the line? Yes. Okay. So I guess my question, simply put, Judge Grierson, is is if there was a writ of possession that has been long standing out there, even before COVID. 19 presented itself is a o 49 something that a uh, 
a tenant could go in and say, um, I, uh, I can't find another place to live. I have an emergency here under AO 49 right now. Does an individual court have the ability to stay uh, a writ of possession? Judge, Judge Greer, Judge Grierson, right? I, mean, I think the answer is yes, but I'd also like to hear. He, he, he was with us. He may need to unmute himself. I mean, sadly, with David's document up, we can't see everybody. <laughs> okay, so let's. So, let's can you let's... hear me now? Yes, there he is. Okay, um, so I, I was saying I agreed with David's analysis, and in response to your question, Senator Srotkin. Under AO 49, either a landlord or a tenant can um, seek an emergency order from the court. Um, and so if a tenant was going to be dispossessed and had no other place to go, uh, they have a right to file um, with the court and lay out whatever the facts are. Um, and the court could consider that. But there is a latter, latter part of this, this bill that David hasn't gotten to yet that talks about writs of possession that have already been executed and they are under this bill, if you pass it, um, they are stayed as well. So even if there's an outstanding writ today, yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, <clears throat> that action on the service of the writ has been stayed by this bill. And if there was ever a question about it, the, the tenant would be able to seek relief from the court under AO 49. Okay, all right. Let Thank me you. ask a question, Michael, if I, uh, yes. I, I would like to go back for a second to uh, section B4 in terms of the particular uh, activities that could result in uh, eviction. If I read it literally, there are three things, criminal acts, illegal drug activity, or acts of violence. And then it's qualified, any of which, meaning those three activities. Uh, I can envision a situation, for example, in which a tenant allows uh, a, a huge amount of garbage or human waste to accumulate within the, uh, within the, uh, the, the property, or allows the water to run such that water runs into another tenant's property. Now, none of those are criminal. They're not illegal drug activity, nor are they acts of violence. Uh, oh. I wonder if that qualified clause is sufficient to clearly cover all of those activities. Uh, I think David answered that when I asked about physical I, extreme damage. And, and I, I would be interested in what Judge Grierson's opinion of that might be. Well, keep in mind, it's my opinion, Senator, of, of what I think this language says. And I believe that uh, B4 is broad enough so that the circumstances you just described would fall under the court's uh, authority under AO 49. Um, I don't see the additional language of criminal activity, drug activity, or violence as limiting the court's authority. I view that as something that says it's including this activity, but it does not, by including those, uh, that type of behavior, prohibit the landlord uh, from um, from seeking relief under AO 49 because of the circumstances you described. And even the circumstances that Senator Clarkson described, um, extreme damage to property uh, could in and, in and of itself be criminal activity if, if it's uh, right. unlawful, uh, mischief, unlawful destruction. Yeah. So the, the kind of behavior you're talking about quite frankly, may qualify as criminal behavior. But even if it didn't, uh, Senator uh, Brock, it, it, I think the court, that is broad enough for the court to continue to act um, as circumstances require. Fine, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, I know Josh Hanford has to leave in 10 minutes. And oh, is that right? I didn't know that, okay. I, I believe he, he can unmute himself. Uh, Josh, is that still correct? Because if if so, we, obvious. I have I have thirty minutes. Oh, okay. I thought you said you had to leave by ten thirty. 
Okay, so let's do this. Then I did. I wasn't aware of that. Let's um, hold our questions on going through the bill at this point, and then we'll hear from Josh so he can leave in a timely fashion. Because if we go, we could take a long time going through the bill if we ask questions right now. So the rules have changed a little bit, and let's let's move forward. Sure, I'll be quick. <clears throat> Um, subsection C, we've looked at this. This addresses pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. So this says when this act takes effect, all pending actions for ejectment and actions for foreclosure are stayed until the end of the emergency period. So that's the state of emergency declaration plus 30 days. Under two, a court of the state before which any matter is stayed shall issue uh, necessary orders and provide notice to the parties of the stay not later than five days after the effective date of this act. I understand that that time frame is not realistic for the court um, and probably needs to be not five days. Uh, under D, new, for, new foreclosure and ejectment actions. So during the emergency period, the landlord may commence an ejectment action. A mortgage lender can commence a foreclosure proceeding, but it's subject to one, two, three, and four here. You can, the plaintiff can only commence the action by filing and not by service. The court has to stay the action as of the date of filing until the end of the emergency period. The plaintiff shall not attempt to serve and a sheriff or constable shall not serve any civil process. And then the deadline for completing service will be pushed back for the 60 days after the emergency period ends. So everything in these new cases from the filing to the service are just going to be paused until the emergency period ends. <coughs> so E deals with writs of possession that aren't yet issued. So during the emergency period, the court will not issue a writ of possession in an, any ejectment action and in any foreclosure action. Under F, writs of possession already issued so three things here. One, a writ that was issued by a court prior to the effective date of this act is stayed as of the start date of the emergency period and resumes running when the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. So notice that that's a different time. And this was negotiated by the stakeholders. So if it's a writ of possession that was already issued before the emergency, they are it is paused, but it unpauses upon the declaration, not at the end of the emergency period. Under two, if a writ of possession was issued but not executed prior to the effective date of the act, then after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration, under A, the plaintiff has to serve or reserve the writ to the defendant. B, the plaintiff shall be restored to possession not sooner than 14 days after service. Under three, if a writ was served but not executed prior to the effective date, then the sheriff or constable who served the writ shall coordinate with the court to determine how to notify the defendant of the stay of the execution date. So that was a little bit different from the last time you saw it. Previously, the suggestion was um, that the sheriff or constable would have the duty to provide written notice on the defendant that there was a stay. This is changed so that the sheriff or constable will work with the court and they will determine how best to notify the defendant that it's been stayed, whether that's certified mail or email, or I don't know what else. There's discretion there to figure out the most effective means uh, collaboratively. I'm going to break my rule just for a second here. Can you just be <coughs> clear with us, yes. the committee, um, the difference between serving a writ of possession and executing sure. a writ of possession? Yeah, so if you think of the writ of possession as, as sort of moving in three phases, um, it's first, so after there's a judgment and the court has decided that uh, the landlord or the owner need, is, has the legal right to be restored, then it issues the writ of possession. That goes to a sheriff or constable who serves it. And they actually, that is service of the writ. The execution comes after that, and execution is the period. If there's a date that comes with your served writ, and it says this writ is going to be executed 
not sooner than 14 days from now, but it'll usually have a date, right? Uh, is my understanding. And that is the date on which the tenant has to be off of the property. And if that date comes and they are not off of the property, then the sheriff or constable uh, shall remove them from the property. That is the execution. And in Vermont, uh, there is no self-help. You can't uh, do a constructive eviction by cutting off the power or locking the doors. You can't move everybody's stuff out onto the front yard. This, this an eviction and ejectment has to, to happen according to these steps. And it has to be the sheriff or constable who executes the writ and accomplishes the change in physical possession of the property. Is it, is it uh, always the case that there's a specific date when that's going to occur that's put put on the writ of possession? That's I believe occur? so. Yes. I mean, there are people who deal with this stuff in real life more than I do, but I believe there is always a date of execution. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Judge. And, and I, I think the reason for us to act quickly is that this is where some of the uncertainty is right now for a handful of people and maybe Jean or Angela can, when we get to them, can give us a better notion of how many people are in this kind of funny limbo between service and execution. But in, in my mind, this is the concerning group that may be affected by this bill. Is that right? I think that's, David. they're I think affected that's for sure. And yeah. this bill, this bill, yeah, would be, you know, the difference between them losing possession and not. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep moving in the interest of time. G resumption yeah, and escrow hearings. Um, so I believe we have looked at this before. Um, this is after the emergency period has ended and we're starting back up with rent escrow hearings under 12 VSA 4853A. So in the first 45 days after the emergency period ends and one of these uh, hearings comes up, um, then there's a, this is gonna be to deal with the problem of how much rent you actually have to pay into court. Um, Right now, under the current law, you would have to pay not only the rent as it's accruing during the pendency of the action, but also all of the back rent, essentially since the action began. So if this emergency goes on for six or seven months, these actions start back up. Under the current law, a tenant who is ordered to pay rent into court at that time is going to have to pay all the rent that is accrued during the entire emergency period. So that could be six, seven, eight, 12 months, who knows, right? That assumes that they haven't been paying rent. Sure, so this would be where a landlord brings, files a motion for an order to, for the court to, to order the defendant to pay into rent because there's been non-payment. So the court has to find that you are obligated to pay and you didn't pay. In that case, they can order you to pay rent so the, the, the change here from the, the deviation from the statute here is that the rent accrual from what is back rent, what's owed, the arrearage, whatever you wanna call it, it will basically start from the end of the emergency period or the date of the service of this motion, um, depending on when it was filed. But the, the net result is gonna be that everybody is paying back rent only from the end of the emergency period or later. I can go through the words, but I'm trying to hurry, unless you have questions. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you just explain, sure. the, I guess, the general rationale? Is that basically uh, relieving tenants of back rent that the landlord's never going to be able to get? Well, it... It relieves the tenant of the obligation of showing up to court and being uh, in a court issuing an order that requires the court to collect back rent from the time a suit was begun. And coming out of, uh, let's say, an eight month emergency where people aren't working and maybe they haven't been paying rent because they can't, then they'll show up to court and they'll be ordered to pay $8,000 in the court because they've missed eight months of rent payment. 
So to avoid that problem, um, the amount that would have to be paid as back rent would be measured from the end of the emergency period or from the time the motion was served, um, if it was served after this act takes effect. So the question I, I hear you asking is, well, what happens to the landlord who now has eight months of back rent that's unpaid? Um, fair question. You know, the action will proceed if the if the tenant pays rent in the court and you know they're legally on the hook to have paid it. So you know, the tenant could still lose and the landlord would still have the legal right to receive that money. Whether the tenant has it, I don't know. Ideally, uh, whatever funding you provide will help the landlords and the tenants in those situations. Okay, well, I, I assume we'll, we'll ask Angela that question. Um, my guess is that the premise is that we're still assuming that the tenant is going to be moved out and that's the primary goal at that point and to the extent that they can get some money during the pendency of the action that's what the landlords want and they're not that concerned with um, the lost rent over the period of of the of the uh, of the crisis so so I do want to note under two here, there is further discretion in the court. It may reduce the amount of rent the defendant must pay after considering A, tenant's ability to pay due to circumstances arising in the emergency period, and B, whether the tenant made good faith attempts to secure available emergency rental payment funds. So the court could set the, the amount at zero or a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars based on the circumstances it's going to be a case-by-case -case decision but the court will have that discretion again this is only for motions for this kind of order that are going to happen in that first 45 days after that we go back to the default standard in section 4853a so two more pieces here under subsection h uh notwithstanding any other provision of this act, an ejectment action for breach of a rental agreement pursuant to 9 VSA 4467B may proceed in court when the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. So this, this gives a 30 day jump um, on these types of actions and the basis that's referenced here in subsection B, there's, there's two of them, it's a, a, a breach of a material term of the rental agreement or B2, which we've already seen above, which is the criminal activity, illegal drug activity, um, et cetera. So if an ejectment action is proceeding on one of those bases, then it can restart as soon as the governor declares an end to the state of emergency. It doesn't have to wait until the end of the emergency period. As Got it. <coughs> Okay, last piece, subsection I, this was uh, formally a change to the underlying statute, which requires notarization. Uh, it has been modified so that only applies during the emergency period. So during the emergency period, notwithstanding 4 VSA 27B, a party may file any document that would otherwise require notarization by including the statement I declare it's true and accurate, best of my knowledge. I'll be so the one addition here is starting on line 13. It says, I will be subject to the penalty of perjury. The statute ends there, and the addition is this last clause, or other sanctions in the discretion of the court. So um, this gives the court some flexibility about what maybe they can impose some other sanction if somebody has filed a false document. Um, or a false attestation. Um, and these other two pieces, two and three, just follow the underlying statute. Right. Great. Thank you. So that's all I have. And I'm going to stop unless there's questions and let other people speak. And you're, you're with us for the duration? I am indeed. Okay. Right. So uh, Denise uh, and Faith, uh, I can see where this is headed. It's already 1030. Uh, uh, um, I'm thinking that our second 
issue uh, we may not get to today. There's a lot of work and discussion that needs to take place here. Um, so why, uh, why don't you call the witnesses or get in touch with the witnesses for the unemployment small business piece um, and tell them uh, uh, that we're not going to go forward with that today. Uh, I, unless people have objections and see a real need to get that information done, I think we really need to focus on this particular bill today. And I think there's going to be a lot of questions. So um, anybody on the committee have concerns with that or feel differently? No, I, I think that's good, particularly because uh, we have the Small Business uh, Solution Task Force meeting at 1.30. Right, right. Okay, um, so if you can call those witnesses and let them know, we're probably gonna postpone them, we'll get back to them. Uh, we'll, we'll postpone them to, to Monday or Tuesday, but we'll, for them to just stay tuned. Uh, can we hear from Josh at this okay, point thank you. As, as to what the governor, uh, for the administration's position on this concept at this point is, and if they've reviewed the bill, whether they have specific concerns. Sure, can you hear me now? Yes, Josh. Yeah. Okay, so for the record, Josh Hanford. Um, first, thanks, Senator Schrock and to you and your committee and, and also Representative Stevens and his committee on this work and the stakeholders. Um, they've done a great job of coming to agreement here. Um, this new version addresses many of the concerns that I brought up before about the public safety issues and the need for those evictions in, in many cases to, to go forward. Um, also the funding piece, uh, I know there might be more time needed on that, but that's kind of critical uh, as well. Um, the sort of flexibility that's given under the existing language is something we support. Um, you know, we will work with the CARES Act and the various uh, funding that's gonna come through on that to uh, leverage and work um, with th this appropriation if it moves forward. Uh, but the latest uh, conversation about what's gonna happen with certain payments um, that haven't been paid to landlords during this period um, my, not being satisfied could have a, a substantial impact on some properties. Um, so I, I know the idea is to move this eviction part forward quickly, uh, maybe come back to that funding. I think that the federal funding is going to be a big help, but there will be holes. Um, a lot of that's going to go through, you know, housing vouchers, rental assistance that is not gonna to touch all the, these situations, um, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, so the governor, uh, particularly on the, the governor's position on this, um, the governor has not been able to review and respond to this bill. He has it last night, um, you know, but like I said, many of the issues we raised earlier have been addressed with this new version and really commend the, the work of the stakeholders to get to this point. I think that, um, you know, it's been brought up that other states have issued executive orders to stop evictions much faster. You know, we've looked at the New Hampshire order, for example. Um, they don't have a court process to go through. Their eviction process is much quicker. Um, and so that was a, of consideration um, in, in the governor looking at an executive order in, in Vermont. Um, that New Hampshire order was reviewed pretty thoroughly and they have a much different process. Um, I think the main point here, it was raised by many in the committee is sort of the balance that we're trying to strike here, relief um, from these evictions during this, this time and the interest of public safety and the balance of folks, this not sending the wrong message that it's okay to not pay. Your, your rent or your mortgage um, and what that might mean. Um, you know, I know uh, Senator Sorokin, Representative Stevens, you received, you know, that those comments from VHFA about uh, industry sort of concerns and that's the balance we're trying to strike here and what the ultimate message of this will be. And, and some of that's out of our control. 
you know, the media, how they look at what this bill says and blast, you know, that there's an eviction and, and rents don't have to be paid, that, that's still of some concern. Um, but the work that's been done is a good step forward. I can't give you the exact governor's position on this today, but I will assure you that it's being looked at um, and that this is good progress. So that's all I really have. If, if there's any questions, I, I'd be happy to try to answer. Could you hear me that, now? I can hear you now. We can hear you. Yeah. Can uh, hear you. I, I say, I'm just trying to do with my mute. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful and encouraging. Um, I think there'll probably be more work to be done on this issue, even if this bill goes forward um, and we're committed to to doing that. I mean, we're in strange circumstances here and trying to get some immediate action, but that doesn't mean we're finished. So thank you. And uh, does any of the committee members have any questions for Josh? Uh, I, I, may I ask one, Michael? Absolutely. Uh, Michael, I mean, Josh. Did you see, did you hear Tom describe um, if we took the money out just because that will slow down the bill for next week, uh, Tom had talked about his committee being more comfortable at the moment with uh, inserting the language to the extent available through federal government funds appropriated will and then deal with section eight. Are, are you, a, would, would, I, have you had a chance to see that and would you support, I mean, you're not saying whether you fully support it at the moment, but is that sort of the direction you're hoping will go in rather than a specific amount? But just to- I heard, Yeah, I heard Representative Stevens. I, I mean, I think that's fair with what you guys are trying to consider and how to move this. Um, and, and we don't have the answers either about the federal funds and what if the 5 million was the right number or not. And clearly, um, exactly. DCF and how they're going to minister this. There's a lot to still be figured out there, but the effort to 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 keep that section in there that uh, you know appropriation to be determined or something is is appreciated. That there's still a placeholder there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And um, my response to that is that I would want to talk with the Rules Committee and the Appropriations Committee because I don't want to in it inadvertently slow down this bill right putting an appropriation section in there we we haven't dealt with this stuff it's kind of crazy you know does this bill then have to go to appropriations for a review and does that set us back a day does it set us back a exactly. week until we next meet we don't know whether we have remote voting yet uh so those kinds of questions also need to be answered but rest assured that um i think a very significant piece of this issue is on the spending end as as well that makes uh people comes up with an equitable solution that tries to make people whole uh as, as to the fullest extent possible um okay uh let's move on uh one of the things that when we hear from the uh the landlords and the tenants and to a lesser extent from the courts is one of the things that I'm concerned about with this bill comes from experience we've already had in other bills. We're moving fast and we don't have necessarily all the facts. So we want to present, uh, prevent the hardship, but we may want to skinny this bill down a bit and not deal with issues that are not immediately before us. And for instance, we don't know what the feds are gonna do on the money and how that can help either shorten the time period of, of coverage of this bill or any of a lot of the words in this bill that deal with what happens after the um, emergency goes away. And I draw people's attention to the orders from the county court uh, judges, uh, the, um, those specific to Chittenden and Washington County, and they seem to have addressed the same problem we're trying to deal with in 
a couple of sentences and paragraphs. Uh, and that seems, what I'm hearing is that seems to get at the heart of the problem that we need to face immediately uh, for uh, the tenants that may be evicted or homeowners that may be being foreclosed upon without getting into a lot of detail of how things are to be dealing with, with in the future. And we may have during, for instance, if we put this into effect for uh, until the declaration is finished and we just dealt with the, the stay and not where, how things are gonna be picked up later on, I'm not minimizing the fact that we need to deal with those things, but we may have more time to deal with them and we may get further input uh, on those things. So for instance, when we were dealing with the unemployment stuff, everything was a moving target from where we were learning about what the federal law did and where were we hearing from other stakeholders who have not been heard from and uh, a whole raft of issues that came up uh, either during or after the time we had to get that passed. So I would like the testimony to, in addition to telling us of the experience of these negotiations of, you know, why every piece of this bill is essential at this point, if you know that we will continue to deal with this issue uh, for issues don't, that don't have the immediacy, but we will continue to deal with them over the course of the next weeks and months. So with that, I'd like to, um, I'm looking for who's on the, Gene, I'd like to hear from you next uh, uh, about where you've been in your negotiations and why you think every part of this bill is essential right now. Thank you. Um, I'm Jean Murray. I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, I, I want to say why uh, we're a stakeholder on the tenant side. Um, when you think about all of the evictions that get filed in Vermont every year, and that um, the most recent data says that's a, almost 1,800 evictions get filed every year, about 150 a month. Most of the defendants, most of the tenants are not represented by counsel. To a great extent, the tenants that are represented by counsel are represented by Vermont Legal Aid. So as we have been sitting um, here talking, I have also been on the email with a lot of my colleagues um, gathering the information about how many cases that we have worked on since Administrative Order 49 came out of the judiciary. So Administrative Order 49 uh, that stayed hearings, that, that's the essential thing that it did. It said, we're not going to hold any hearings unless they're an emergency. Um, that came out on March 16th. Um, since that time, uh, Legal Services Vermont and Vermont Legal Aid have uh, filed, I think we filed 22 uh, motions to stay. How we found these people, um, Vermont Legal Aid called all of the sheriffs and said, what uh, writs of possession are you holding? And then we got the names of those people and called them and asked them to call us so we could file motions to stay. Um, we also had people where we knew because we had worked out um, settlement agreements for eviction cases that we knew that people had um, writs of possession coming up. In other words, the execution date had already been uh, set and we knew that these were coming up because of settlements that we had been involved in. And so that's where we got uh, knowledge of 22 cases where writs of possession were, the dates were coming due since March 13th, the dates were coming due um, and we found 22 of them. And right now, uh, I think 10 or 11 stays have been granted and 11 uh, motions for stay are pending. Um, in the meantime, individual county courts, uh, starting with Chittenden, Washington, um, then Windsor, and this morning Wyndham, have done that brief um, stay. But the, that 
what that says is that uh, they will they won't hold any hearings on writs of possession and won't issue any, which is fine, which is great, but that doesn't take care of the ones that were already agreed to and are already pending and those dates are coming up. So this bill is needed to um, stay all of those all across the state. Um, right. So that's what we've been doing. Let, let, me, let me ask a question because I'm a little unclear. So the 22 are where the writs of possession have been issued. I don't know if I can't remember whether it's by a judge or by the court clerk. And that writ of possession has been served on the tenant. And in that writ of possession, it says, two weeks from now, I'm coming there. If you're not out, I'm going to move you out. Different writs of possession have different number of days. Okay. And so yes, they these are ones that the the court has issued a writ of possession or the um, parties, the landlord and tenant have agreed that a writ of possession will issue um, and that the, and they've agreed as to the move out date. Um, and those were coming up where people, um, settled their cases and tenants walked out of court with a possession in their hands that set a specific date. Um, that's 20, that's 22 that you've found by calling the sheriffs or by they were your clients to begin with? Um, yes, and we have done a little bit of looking through uh, dockets, um, but the court keeps a docket on every case. And as I say, there's 150 cases filed a month all across the state. And so it's not that easy to find them by just looking at docket entries. That would be a lot of docket entries to review. Okay. Are, all, are all of those, have they been, all of them been served already by a sheriff or constable? Well, we pulled back some from the sheriff. We found out where the sheriffs were holding them and hadn't yet served them. Okay. They had them in their in baskets to serve. Okay. Um, some have already been served and some are already in the hands of the tenants because they walked out of court with them in their hands. Um, okay. And you're saying if they have been served, the orders from these four counties doesn't cover that the sheriff is going to go out and, and move people out of the houses if the people don't leave. Right. Neither administrative order 49 nor these four counties orders would uh, stop the execution of the writs that are in people's hands. Like for instance, we um, talked to the sheriff in Caledonia County who was holding some uh, writs in his hand and he said, um, you know, he, whatever, he needed to communicate with the tenants about this, but he also told them to call legal aid so that legal aid could file motions to stay. Thank you for, thank you. Is there any, uh, Judge Grierson, I know you you probably had conversations with the judges that have issued this, why they didn't, could they have, and why didn't they order sheriffs who uh, a writ of possession had been served uh, to, did they purposely, they must have known that those people were still I don't want to be judgmental, but at risk. Um, do they purposely leave out that group of people? Um, Senator, I, I, I have spoken uh, with the judges. Um, I can't tell you why they didn't issue orders broader than the ones that have been issued but keep in mind that with those five counties uh, having issued these orders, that le still leaves uh, nine counties that haven't issued these, these right. orders. Right. And, and the, uh, the other issue, as simplistic as the orders appear, um, so far they have not been challenged whether or not an individual judge can issue a standing order uh, 
for a class of cases as opposed to an individual case based on its circumstances. So right. I, I can't tell you why the judges that issued these orders um, didn't go further than they did. Um, but there are still more than half of the counties out there that have not issued these kinds of orders. And from what I understand, will not be issuing similar orders. So you, right now you have a mix uh, of orders out there relating to these issues. And if nothing more, the bill would resolve that uh, right. inconsistency. I understand the rationale for, of uniformity. I was just, it just struck me as curious is if they were trying to achieve uh, a goal of dealing with this virus uh, COVID-19, why they stopped short on uh, a small number of people who were still in their homes and still in the process and why there was, whether you knew of any rationale as to people who had been served with writs of possession wouldn't get the same protection. Um, I, and I can't speak to, to that, uh, Senator, I, but why they didn't go but beyond you, what they did i i but just, you agree with uh um gene that the the orders that have come out thus far do not protect somebody there's no stay on somebody who's already been served with the writ of possession uh, some of the orders vary a little bit in their language but overall i would agree with with that statement okay thank you okay yeah uh, uh, go that's ahead. helpful I, I did want to say, uh, now I lost my train of thought. I would like, one of the things about the, the stakeholders in this, um, and Angela can also speak to this, is um, legal aid is at this table because uh, we represent a lot of tenants. The people that represent a great deal of landlords, um, landlord Vermont Landlord Association, and we also heard from the attorney that um, represents a lot of the large nonprofits. Um, to work out these things. We are really familiar with all the ins and outs of um, eviction process and all the beginning and the middle and end. And so that's, so the things in this order, I believe um, you wanted to talk about why all of these different pieces were uh, necessary. We wanted to be very specific about um, that this is staying the cases staying the issuance of orders, uh, uh, staying the issuance of writs of possession, staying the issuance of uh, orders for foreclosure sale, staying um, executions of writs of possession. And we took each of those independent actions and were very specific about it. Um, there were some questions about rent into court process. Um, the idea of rent into court in Vermont system, the court holds a hearing on whether or not the landlord's complaint for eviction um, should be granted, whether the landlord should be granted possession and um, how much money who owes to who. So all of those are set up um, to be regular trials. Um, and because that process can take a couple of months, Vermont has a rent into court statute. And the rent into court statute says at any time in the eviction process that the tenant becomes delinquent in any amount of rent, not the whole rent or whatever, they're just delinquent in any amount of rent, the landlord can seek a rent into court order um, so that there is money um, there at the end of the case, not necessarily all the money that the landlord is owed, but there is some money while the case pens. So at the when the case comes to judgment, the court decides how much total money is owed to the landlord. And so nothing about rent into court or this particular piece where we have uh, said at the time the rent into court hearing is held, um, it will be the rent owed from the end of the state of the emergency or service up until the rent into court day and then ongoing further. Um, nothing about that process says that tenants don't owe the whole rent. They owe the whole rent. And what we 
are advising people um, is that it, even if they have reduced income during the state of emergency, they should be paying what rent they can because at the end of the day, they're gonna owe the whole thing. Um, so that's, I hope that clarifies a little bit about why the rent into court order piece is in there. Um, because we expect that once the state of emergency is ended, people will go back to work, but it will take them a while to earn enough money to be able to pay um, their whole rent into court. Um, so the part that we went through with David Hall, where it seemed to say that um, new rent into court proceedings should only capture the rent from the time of uh, that proceeding uh, to, uh, it should start with the time of that proceeding and have a payment schedule going forward until uh, the eviction takes place. It sounded to me like what it said was that because of this stay, uh, at least in terms of what the court was ordering, in the rent, rent into court process would not include the period of the stay. It, it may not, um, but the, the point is it would, be, it would allow the tenant an ability to keep their apartment while the ejectment process got adjudicated. So, because they would be paying on a schedule going forward, but it wouldn't, um, essentially preempt that process by saying, hey, today $8,000 is due um, and oh, you don't have it, so get out now. It, it is a, what we, what we assume is going to happen is that there will be rental relief money um, available. That's one of the pieces of the rent into court, which is um, when the judges set rent into court, we're, this bill would allow them for 40 days after the emergency period, 45 days after the emergency period to consider the financial circumstances, which is not currently in the law. So it would just, this is just a session law. It would just be for this time. Um, and in considering the tenant's financial circumstances, the judge could also consider whether the tenant availed themselves of available rental assistance funding during this time. In other words, we're really, this is not for rent forgiveness. This is, this is we're trying to balance uh, the responsibility of tenants um, with what is practical during this period of time. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Jean? <coughs> no. Let's move, on. Let's move on to Angela. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Sorokin and the committee. My name is Angela Zykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. I'm also a practicing attorney and I represent landlords throughout the state of Vermont, uh, generally in eviction proceedings. So I am uh, very well versed on sort of the landlord side of the eviction process and a lot of the issues that they are facing. Um, I just, I want to let the committee know that while you are seeing this bill for the first time in this version, uh, this is something that behind the scenes, uh, many of us have been working on for a couple of weeks. And what we have tried to bring you is a balanced bill where we have spent considerable time weighing both the rights and responsibilities for tenants and for landlords. And given this sort of extreme situation that we have found ourselves in have tried to find a balance where we have protections that given the governor's order going to provide uh, some safety for people to stay in their homes, but also balances the needs and interests of landlords. And one of the biggest components to this bill is the funding piece and the expectation that some assistance is going to be available to help people make their rent payments. Um, landlords are being encouraged to communicate with their banks to inquire about mortgage forbearance to provide some relief for them on that regard. I know some municipalities 
have extended tax payment deadlines without penalties or interest, that also can provide some relief. Um, but this is a time when we all need to be in this together. And so we have created uh, this uh, bill to try to do that, to not only deal with this period of emergency, but for a brief period after that, as we know the courts are going to be um, dealing with a huge number of cases that they have to address, uh, that people are going to be newly back to work and trying to find a sort of collaborative approach to just keep the process and people safe and, and moving forward. And along with making sure landlords get rent payments or have some money coming in. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions. That last, that last point is, um, I know we heard, or at least last week we heard from uh, Mr. Handy and it seemed like he wasn't necessarily comfortable that this bill or this proposal uh, would have money coming in, continuing to come into to landlords. Uh, is he part of your association or are, there, are you hearing from landlords that uh, feel differently? What I, what I am hearing from landlords is they are wanting to know what resources are available for their tenants. Many of them are in communication with their tenants and will be passing that information <laughs> along. Um, this bill in section eight contemplates expanding the emergency housing program beyond its current state uh, to allow, and I think the bill also would provide for some additional rules. Those are not things that have been worked out. I mean, one option would be to allow landlords to petition in for the rent payments if their tenants haven't done it. Um, those are not things that have specifically been worked out in this bill, but could be a way to ensure that the money goes to landlords for rent payments. Okay. Um, given the... Uh, may, may I ask Angela a question? Yes. Um, Angela, how many of your landlords are applying to any of the SBA programs uh, you know, that are available for small businesses, because they're all basically small businesses. Right, they, they are. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I know I've been providing them with that information. And I believe the application today is the first day that actually applications are open, or maybe even Monday. So we're not quite there yet. Um, right. But that information has been provided to them. Um, whether they're taking advantage of it, I, I don't know. Um, but I am getting getting that out and I have uh, received communication and information directly from some of the SBA representatives. Great, because uh, there, there is going to be obviously some assistance for them as small business owners or, or not so small business owners. A ab absolutely, absolutely. And part of my job right now is just to get that information out to them so they know. So uh, it, it sounds like you would love like to have us keep Section 8 and that you'd like to have us uh, add the language that Tom Stevens was talking about to the extent that possible we would be putting money, no matter where it originated, state, feds, wherever, uh, in, into this. Yes, I think Section 7 and Section 8 are critical components to this bill. Um, whether but section modified a modified and more flexible section seven. I, I think that's probably prudent. I understand that the number that was in there was a placeholder. Right. So that um, from your perspective is critical even, even if we were intent upon doing something in that area, but we thought that provision slow, would slow down the bill uh, your position on the bill would change if we deleted it just to make sure we can get this passed quickly and doesn't have to go to the appropriations through the appropriations process. I, I have always said through this process that providing a funding mechanism for tenants and for landlords is critical. Um, and 
I think it becomes more critical if we're talking about stopping the processes which allow landlords to deal with these financial issues um, to the extent that it needs to be stripped out at this time to move this bill along. Um, it, it makes me uncomfortable because I think the funding is the critical piece here um, right. and, and ha providing that security. Okay. Do you have um, um, the question of the ancillary pieces of this bill beyond the moratorium pieces? Um, uh, as I said before, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, in terms of uh, not knowing which, what we're gonna learn in the next 30 days on a number of fronts to be dealing with some of the detail in this bill. I appreciate certainly as a former lobbyist, <laughs> the fact of all the work that's been done behind the scenes and it's, uh, it's actually very good news for, the, for legislators to hear that's a, there's agreement among the stakeholders, uh, but uh, to date, but um, the question of waiting on some of those pieces for more information with the full intent of maybe coming up with the exact same language a month from now, uh, but having, having heard from everybody and knowing all the facts, whether we need to add those pieces now. And I guess what I'm thinking of is taking something like the court orders and adding the writs of possession and executions of writs of possession that have been uh, served and, inc and including a stay on execution of those and making a very simple bill. I just would like to hear your response on that. I'm not um, necessarily wedded to that idea for sure. Yeah. Sure, I, I think one of the things that we were trying to do with bringing you a comprehensive bill is to give uh, the landlords and tenants and the various folks who work with landlords and tenants some plan and some predictability and some certainty and understanding what they are going to be facing while we're under this state of emergency. Um, part of the issue that I think all of us are having is a level of uncertainty. And so if we deal with just part of it now and say we're going to save the rest of it for later, we still have a huge deal of uncertainty of what that's going to look like. Um, right. So I think the entire bill is important okay. for that reason. Well, I thank you for that. And obviously the flip side is if we learn new things, we could always amend the bill in accordance with that. Uh, Correct. Well. But I appreciate the work you've done. Um, okay, that's that's great. Uh, Judge Grierson, um, I remember there was some administrative difficulties for the courts the last time I was involved in a hearing here. Has that been addressed in terms of a time frame of notices or have you been relieved of that obligation somehow? Well, the, the short answer is no, as I look at this draft, um, but during the course of the morning here, I've had a chance to look at previous drafts where I thought the parties had agreed to eliminate. Uh, I'm looking at the paragraph, oh, let's see, it's under C, pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. And if you look at paragraph two, it talks about uh, the court would give notice not later than five days and I thought the parties had agreed to remove that, at least a, an earlier draft, an interim draft from one of the parties had eliminated that. Um, so. Yes, we, we talked about that on Tuesday. I, I thought that that was gonna be changed too, that the time frame that you were gonna add a, a, a more realistic time frame. Uh, Brian. No, I think, well, I think what I said was the five days wasn't realistic and I think it would be a mistake to put any time frame because the reality is we would get out notice as soon as we can and having a ar arbitrary time doesn't seem to assist the process. We'll either, if you put in a, another time frame, we'd either make it or we wouldn't, but the, the important thing is to get the, or, the notices out there. Um, so I would just suggest that it be left that we'll get notice out. Um, 
-hmm. and, I, and I thought I thought the part I thought the uh, I thought Angela and Jean and the rest of the folks involved had agreed that 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 time limit could come out. And uh, b before I say anything further, I would just say that um, Angela, Jean, uh, Wendy Morgan, and Nancy Seibeck have worked Seibeck have have worked extremely hard bring this bill to where it is now and the court's involvement. Um, they've shared drafts as they've gone along. The court had, I'm going to say about a half a dozen um, relatively discrete issues that we wanted to address and the parties uh, have addressed the concerns of the judiciary uh, with the exception of this five day limit, which I thought was coming out and just the paragraph before it and I'll uh, I'll explain that in a minute, but other than that, those two paragraphs, um, the court um, is comfortable with this bill, and I understand okay. your concern, Senator Sorotkin, um, about the simplicity of those other court orders, but um, I think, and again, you've heard me say it before, I think what's important is consistency across uh, the state, and this bill, um, I think, attempts not only to address pending cases, which is critical, um, cases that may come up during this interim period, which we don't know how long it's going to last, but a framework that suggests a way at the end of this emergency period. Um, I can tell you that the court obviously is cognizant of what they could be facing at the end of this emergency period. They are also uh, working towards a, a plan, but I think everyone needs to have some plan and in, in, in shape and we may have to change it. So I do have one other change, but I don't want to get into that unless the committee wants me to at this point. Um, it would be help if you can do it quickly. Yes, sure, I, like I can do it. So, but, but, uh, but, sorry, first, sorry, Brian, could we just hear from Jean and, and Angela about the five days? I mean, sure. was there, did you guys discuss that? And it, what, what's your, could, yeah. because in an earlier draft, it had already been taken out. So what I think is just a little bit of an accident here that it that it. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, that so, would be my recollection as well. So it would just say in paragraph two shall issue any necessary orders and provide notice to the parties of the stay. Period. Do you have that, David? David, David, you're muted. Yes, I have it. Thank you. Okay, so thank just you. And then if you go to the preceding paragraph, and again, uh, Jean and Angela, I think we had agreed on this. It reads the last clause and outstanding orders in those actions are stayed. That is a very broad concept, and there may be orders that folks do not want um, stayed. So the <laughs> language that, again, in an earlier draft we had included was at the end of where it says uh, foreclosures under 12 VSA chapter 172, at that point, the language was going to read as well as any outstanding orders in those actions, which could lead to execution of a writ of possession against a tenant or a resident are stayed until the end of the emergency period. And then it, that language would make it clear that what we're dealing with is orders that would result in someone being removed from premises as opposed to any number of other orders that may be in effect. And I think the parties had agreed to that language. Yes, that's my re recollection we had, yes. That is not language that I have. I may have, I may have. David, I, I can send you that language. Okay, thank you. I, I would echo that I agree. I think it just got left out of this draft. Okay, so go ahead, Judge. Th those were the only uh, changes. Otherwise, as I said, the parties um, had worked hard to get the draft to this point, and they had reflected other changes we had suggested. So, uh, thank you. The court supports this bill in its present form with those right. minor changes. Thank you. So we haven't talked very much about foreclosures. Um, what can uh, Jean, uh, what can you tell us about the discussions around that? And have there been other stakeholders that have talked about that? I mean, we're doing a, a bill here that 
not only limits evictions, but limits uh, foreclosure actions? Um, well, for both ejectment and foreclosure, the, um, the landlord or the mortgagee can file the case and commence it. So it's those, if there's deadlines or, or um, limitations, those, those actions can still be filed. They just need to um, stay or pause right where they are. The, we, Legal Aid in the past has done a lot um, with foreclosures. And so I understand the foreclosure process and I can outline it for you. Um, but the notion is at, by the end of the foreclosure process, after the redemption period has happened, the plaintiff can seek a writ of possession, which is a 30 day writ. Um, and we know of, of the 22 things that I mentioned, at least one of the pending motions is to stay a writ of possession um, in a foreclosure case. So um, at the end of a foreclosure, well, not the end, it's not quite the end of a foreclosure case, it's kind of in the middle, because once the period of redemption is ended, a lot of times a foreclosing mortgagee wants to have the property vacant so that they can move on to a foreclosure sale. Um, the standing orders in the, I guess five, because Franklin County has now um, added a, a standing order similar to Chittenden, Washington, Windsor and Wyndham, um, says that they will stay all orders for foreclosure sale. Um, but if there's writ of, writs of possession outstanding in foreclosure cases, just like there are writs of possession outstanding in ejectment cases, um, those need to be stayed too. And so that's why foreclosures are included. So, I mean, I guess the counterpart to the landlord association in these negotiations for foreclosures might be lending institutions. Uh, have you been in contact with any lending institutions? I know we heard, um, we were mm. here briefly from Chris, Chris. Yeah. I don't know that we have uh, online, but certainly there have been emails exchanged. Um, have you been, have you heard anything from any of those lending institutions with their potential issues with this legislation or did the house as far as you know? Um, other than Chris Delia, I don't think we've heard anything. Um, if Wendy is on the call, she may have had some contacts with uh, some other people. I mean, Chris Delia's argument was essentially foreclosure process is different. It already takes a long time. Um, and it is true that it there is the six month uh, period of redemption between the time the case is filed, a judgment is granted, six month period of redemption is right in the statute. And then there is a second um, period of redemption uh, all the way up to the time of sale. In other words, if the homeowner can uh, pay off everything they owe, that's what redemption means. Um, but all, there's cases in process. Um, right. By my count, there's 852 foreclosures filed a year, and it, it doesn't really matter how long the process was before uh, the period of redemption ends. Um, right now, we've got a number of cases where the period of redemption is ending and that a um, writ of possession could be sought. So uh, that's why we included uh, foreclosures, um, not that not to stop the beginning of the case because the beginning of the case can still happen. Right. To stop the very end of the case. Right. And, and there is an off ramp for foreclosures for the emergency situations like there is for evictions where the parties could go in and plead their case still? Um, if there was an emergency, uh, yes. And I, I imagine emergency isn't going to be um, as big of a thing in a uh, foreclosure case as it might be in an eviction case. Um, right. We did have a conversation. And we, we did end up putting some things in there, I believe at, at the uh, suggestion of the judiciary about the foreclosure um, piece, uh, thinking about um, 
empty properties, but. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing something on that, but I don't know exactly what. Uh, our feeling about, so where a lot of times mortgage lenders or the foreclosing mortgagee is not necessarily a Vermont bank or somebody local. A lot of times it is somebody who's, um, who's the servicer of a mortgage who is somebody from a national company. And while they might believe that the place is already vacant, uh, our experience has been that the places aren't necessarily vacant. Um, they, they may not have heard from the homeowner in a, in a long time. And I guess the difference for me is right in the landlord tenant um, statute, in properties, um, the tenants are required and, and landlords are required to check in with each other if they think that the property is vacant. They're supposed to ascertain the intentions of the tenant um, and that nothing exists like that in, in the foreclosure process. As a matter of fact, by the time a foreclosing mortgagee, which could be a national servicer, is um, on the scene, the homeowner often doesn't have a number to call that will actually be answered by a person who knows what's going on. So there are a lot of, uh, we have had more than one case of um, the bank thinking that the property was empty when it is actually still occupied. So, um, so and the, why the we five, include. And the five counties that have initiated this countywide stay, those apl apply to foreclosures equally? Well, they, they apply to in the 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 wording from the five counties is fairly standard, and it applies to anybody seeking a motion for a writ of possession. But again, that's just in five counties, and it leaves the oh, other. I nine. understand that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it does apply to foreclosures, not just evictions. Yes, it would. I, th I believe. Okay. And what is just what is the process? Uh, I think I understand the process from an issuance of a writ of possession um, and service of a writ of possession to execution. And I think that's one of the key gaps we're trying to deal with on the eviction side. Is, right. is that the same thing for a foreclosure that there is a writ of possession issued and served and then the person has to get out by a certain day? In, um, in an eviction judgment, it says um, if judgment is granted to the, the statute literally says if judgment is granted to the plaintiff, the court shall issue a writ of possession. Um, in foreclosure, the plaintiff, the foreclosing mortgagee, needs to make a motion for a writ of possession. Um, but uh, Okay, so once, once they get that writ of possession, then it's the same thing. It goes to the sheriff and the sheriff serves it and then executes it if during the period of time uh, that the, the, the homeowner doesn't get out, then they can be moved out. Is that correct? Yes. So um, it, the court does not send these things to the sheriff. The plaintiff takes the writ of possession that's been issued by the court and delivers it to the sheriff. Writs of possession, um, according to law, um, are effective for 60 days. Um, in other words, the date of execution mentioned in the writ of possession, um, if it's not served, the writ of possession expires by itself in 60 days. Is that right, Angela? Did I get that right? <laughs> um, that's, that's correct. So, uh, so plaintiffs, when they have a writ of possession, they call the sh sheriff, send the paperwork over to the sheriff. Angela would know more about that than I would. Uh, okay, so let me, let me interrupt you. A couple of us have received an email from uh, Chris Delia, who would like to testify, and he has been asking uh, consistently to testify. So I'd like to figure out a way if Faith or Denise can let him be unmuted and he could uh, tell us if he has any concerns or at least educate us on things we might need to know. Is that possible, Faith? 
This is Faith. If Denise sends him an invitation and he sends me an email when he's ready, we'll um, open the meeting. Great. Okay, we'll do that right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, now I got to get back to where I was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. There we go. Um, okay. So uh, does anybody have any further questions for any of our witnesses at this point while we await to hear from Chris? No, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Uh, yep. I, I guess my one question is how we can facilitate the money piece, making it flexible uh, and, um, for the for the moment and and maybe having a talk with Jane to figure out how we could keep it out of appropriations. Okay, we will do that. I'm feeling like given the time frame here, we may have to have a, a meeting on Monday um, or hopefully not very long before we right. take and uh, how does given that we're I understand from Becca that we're meeting Wednesday uh, as a body. Right. And so if we came to consent, if we could agree and vote out this bill on Monday, that gives us time to consider it on Wednesday, right? I would think so. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, while we're waiting for Chris, I'd like to have a little bit of committee discussion on, um, you know, levels of comfort with the bill and on the other outstanding issues committee members uh, may have um, and specifically whether uh, I guess we want to go the route sort of similar to what the house deadlines are or uh, shorten them with the idea of continuing to look at it or leave them there and if we find out new information we'll come back and amend the bill uh so it's open for discussion at this point uh, i i i think we're in a good place on this bill the one concern i have and it's ongoing is is the commercial leases which is i i had wanted after we finish this discussion to get a Good sense point. from David about how complicated or not it would be to uh, add something about commercial rent. Because uh, again, for small businesses like restaurants in particular, the rental piece is really hanging over their heads. So I, I, I was hoping we could do something with it, but it may be something we could do as a further action. Uh, it's, uh, it's right. I really appreciate that point. I meant to raise it. And I think probably the way to go if we're shooting for Wednesday is to make a commitment to take that issue up separately. And uh, we will find out, you know, how big of a, uh, an issue it is and how immediate of an issue it is. Uh, I know there's a lot of help out there on the federal side for small businesses, uh, both landlords who are who are renting shopping centers or commercial businesses as well as the tenant restaurants uh but i think if we start opening that issue now uh we're going to slow down this oh, which is pretty close to closure I, I agree and i just wanted to get a sense from david about how how difficult it is but maybe we could talk about that on monday because we're our time is already short I think it would also be useful to the extent that we can uh, get a sense of what the federal timelines are to provide us with more information because acting on this, the, the federal information is really critical. Yeah, I, I share that belief, but I've come around to the point that uh, we're gonna have to be nimble and flexible and we could, we could do something different than what the house has suggested and we continue to look at it over the next couple of weeks as we learn more from the Fed, or we can um, uh, we can do exactly or very similar to the House has done, and also continue to look at it over the next couple of weeks and make a change. So, right. uh, and I what we heard from the landlords 
uh, lobbyist is that there's a certain degree of comfort they take in knowing that at least as a default placement going forward beyond the lifting of the declaration they have some plan from the legislature already and i think they've worked hard at it and you don't always find the landlords and tenants in agreement and i think you know part that's part of the i think part of the thing is that we're all in this together and people yeah. realize it yeah back on her cheryl i think we're in good shape I'm cheryl a woman of many words <laughs> cheryl I said, I'm glad to see the stakeholders agreeing. And I, I agree that to have at least a skeleton of a plan beyond the emergency is something that is, is necessary. And if we need to change it, we can always amend things. Yep. So, and, and, and realistically, the only thing that's gonna happen immediately is the stay. So we will have time to look at other issues, um, but, I'm still think waiting for Chris. Uh, Denise, any luck? Getting there. A good new break moment. I just heard from Chris, no email yet. It's coming. Some technical difficulties. Does that, well, we all theoretically our invitation. Would that work if we? Or we're, not, or we're not allowed to do that. Um, if we Senator, Chris, Denise has sent it out. We'll get Chris on shortly. If you would just hang with us, it would be great. Okay. Thank we, you. Anybody have anything else to add at this point? David, there are a couple of changes that you've heard about. Um, we can talk after as well. And uh, we can get that out to the committee as soon as possible. Uh, do we want to set a time for Monday to button up this? Um, finally. Um, so why don't we just do 930? Why don't we do 930? Okay, why don't we do 930? And we'll probably just do this. And as long as it just takes us, and we'll probably set another meeting for Tuesday at our usual time um, from 9.30 to 11.45 with an agenda yet to be determined. Yeah. And while you, we're waiting for Chris Delia, can I just say, I was, I was disappointed. I understood why DOL needed to cancel on us, but I'm actually hearing more about that issue than any other issue right now, that people still cannot get through to DOL. And so I don't know how we can be supporting them better. I don't know if they've been asking for what they need, but more than any other issue, that is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I think you could probably hearing more of it. Um, it's, I have a, a daughter-in-law who's living up here with us now who just lost her job yeah. in New York state and she can't get through to the New York state. The, yeah. Uh, uh, so it is a, you know, it is a question of resources. And I, I, I think one of the things I said to them when I was on the phone with them was, you know, what you need really ha ha has to come from you. Asking right. them, we're a partner. We don't know the minutia of your system, whether you can use more staff, more IT, right. but there's dollars out there and we need to worry about repaying those dollars later if it's going to make a difference in terms of flattening the curve. So we need to get these people um, some support. And uh, so, and we'll, we'll be talking about that. If you want to join in on our task force call at what time is it? One thirty. at this one, point? One thirty. No, it's not technically within our jurisdiction, but I'm sure it's going to get there. Okay. Thank you. No question. Yeah. It's in Cheryl's, Cheryl, you and Chris have been tasked with the UI stuff, right? Um, we're doing with the um, inequities in payments. Oh. Right, right. Yep. Um, okay, I'm still waiting for Chris. I better charge my laptop here. So if, if we have a, a moment, can I ask a question? Absolutely, David. 
So considering uh, the discussion that you just had about commercial leases and whether you'll pursue that issue in another vehicle, um, can I go ahead and just add a small piece to this bill that expressly limits it to ejectment actions concerning residential leases? Oh, right. They yeah. had asked for that. That you'd asked for that on page 10, the uh, before the duties, you'd asked for that third definition. If that's what you want. Uh, I think we probably need it at this point. Um, I, I, I'm, and then it, on maybe on Monday, you could leave a, a little bit of room just to explain to us the complexities of the commercial lease intervention. I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, you can, I think you should put that in. Uh, I think we will deal with that. I mean, I don't know if, if those, Judge Grierson, do you know whether um, the orders in the five counties extends to commercial leases as well? I'd have to reread them, uh, Senator, with that in mind. I don't have one right in front of me, but um, okay. I think they were geared, I want to say they were geared to residential, but I could be wrong on that. Okay. okay. Gene may have. Uh, David will probably that, know. That, that really wouldn't change my opinion of how we should approach this at this point. Right. I think we want to hear from some of the, we did hear from one Jed Davis from the farmhouse group, uh, but we haven't heard from, and, and, uh, and, and I, actually that raises one other question I have for the stakeholders here. Um, generally, we've heard from some public entities, public housing, entities that they had some concern with the moratorium. And I'm wondering, I assume you've had discussions with them and I trust that their overarching concerns have been addressed. Uh, there was some concern that it may affect uh, bonding markets and the treasurer might have some issues. So could, could uh, Gene, could you touch upon that a little bit? Um, my understanding um, from an email from Moore Collins a, a few days ago um, that the CARES Act and the HUD um, affects HUD funded properties and low income housing tax credit properties are not funded by HUD. And so the CARES Act isn't specifically um, addressing them, which is why they're concerned about making sure they're funded for those kind of low-income companies. Uh, the CARES Act and the HUD, um, wow, I'm echoing. Um, See, it's, it's Chris. Chris Delius joined us. And Chris, if you mute, then we won't hear ourselves on the live stream. Thanks so much. Yep. And welcome. Go ahead, Jean. Um, so they were, um, they were, they are concerned about making sure that there's rental assistance available for tenants in the uh, low-income tax credit properties. Is so, it a concern that you're you're worried about? I, I think so. I mean, so we could deal with that in making sure that our appropriation language is not in any way. Uh, limit ourselves to CARES Act funding if CARES Act monies is restrictive because we have uh, potential to use other monies as well to to make sure there's no um, inequities perhaps there. Uh, but so that's, there has been no follow-up as far as you know? Um, I, 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 will, I will follow up with you and, and others to make sure there's no lingering issue there at this point right. over the weekend. I think the person to follow up with is the Earhart from Affordable Housing yep. Coalition. Um, but my understanding is they they are still like wondering exactly what money is coming and where it's coming and, and how to figure it out. They, they yeah. don't know yet, they're, they're worried about it. I will get in touch with Earhart. We were playing uh, email tag at 2.30 in the morning last night. <laughs> um, okay, so Chris, 
you unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I hope you will educate us and not throw a wrench in this whole thing at this point. <laughs> uh, well, good morning, folks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify for your record, Chris Delia, president of the Vermont Bankers Association. Uh, this is an interesting day for the banking industry and businesses in Vermont because we have been spending the last five or six hours trying to get the Paycheck Protection Act program up and running. And while we got the guidance, final guidance last night from Treasury at about 6.30, I can tell you that the infrastructure behind the scenes was not ready. And it is uh, an incredible challenge trying to roll that out this morning. That said, I wanted to listen to your discussion this morning on this bill. Uh, and Senator, to your point, if we were talking here last week, as I had testified with Representative Stevens Committee and Representative Marcotte's committee, I would have voiced opposition to the foreclosure portions of this bill for reasons that I will briefly go into. Uh, but at this point, it's clear to me that the train has left the station. So I will uh, still voice that opposition, but it's not gonna stop me from passing the bill. Uh, at this point, and the reason uh, I offered the testimony last week is because the issue in the marketplace has really passed this discussion by. Uh, we got to a point very early on in this crisis that we were working with borrowers and have been on both the commercial and residential side that none of my institutions were going to move with forward with foreclosure, even if it was in process. Right. Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase have not moved forward with foreclosure. The secondary markets have shut down the foreclosure process. In listening to Judge Grierson the other day in his testimony, uh, and, I, and I had to call him just to verify, even the courts have basically stayed anything that's going to go on with the foreclosure process. So at this point, and last week, my view is, why do we need a piece of legislation that has already been dealt with in the marketplace? Uh, we recognize, well, first of all, we don't want to throw anybody out of their homes. We would love it if everybody paid their bills, but that's not the reality. In today's environment, we are not going to throw anybody out of their homes because it creates more of a healthcare crisis than anything else. So uh, while I appreciate Jean's testimony, I felt it was important that I represent my industry and you, you hear directly from us as to what we are doing. And I can tell you on foreclosures, we're not doing anything at this point and have no intent to do anything until we get out of this crisis and the courts are back up and running and then if there is a new normal, we will get back to that. So that was my opposition to the legislation. But again, the trains left the station, so I understand that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And, my, and my apologies for not getting you into the committee uh, last week. I was uh, had other things I was dealing with. So uh, I appreciate you coming on now, and uh, I think we're we're good to to go. Unless anybody has any questions for Chris. Just Michael, just yeah. just one question, Chris. Does that apply to all foreclosures, including commercial? I well, as you can imagine, Senator, we are working countless hours, regardless of what passed with Congress last Friday. We are working countless hours to try and help all of our borrowers, both commercial and residential. Uh, and that includes any number of approaches based on their individual circumstances. So forbearance and so on. The challenge you run into with commercial, as you alluded to earlier, Senator sure. Sorokin, is the relationship between the commercial entity and the property owner that they're renting from. And, and that's beyond our control. We're actually on both sides of that because we've got a business that we've probably funded who's renting that space. And then we've got the landlord that we probably funded who's leasing that right. space. And, and, but, but the purpose of eviction or, or the, the issue of eviction is really left up to them. Our goal working with the businesses right now, whether it's the landlord or the tenant, is to try and avail them of the PPP program to see whether they can access funding under that. I, I can tell you right now, just to give you a quick glimpse, 
As of 9.30 this morning, there were 50 applications, excuse me, 50 banks across the country that had filed 1,123 applications and $402.5 million had already been claimed under the program. It's a $350 billion program. I'm concerned by the end of the day or Monday, it's all drawn down. And right. then we're having to go back to Congress to figure out what the next package looks like. So right. this is, you can't believe the pace this is moving at right now. Right, Chris, for a program a, that hasn't rolled out yet. I mean, that's just rolling uh, in. Chris, a you program a, that unfortunately, as I had a conference call with our SBA director this morning, I have four pages worth of questions from my bankers who are rolling out the program today without those questions being answered. So, right. I, I and I commend SBA. They have done a phenomenal job. This has really been Treasury who's been driving the bus in developing the guidelines. And I have to give them some credit because they did it in less than six days. But every time you get the new guidelines comes out, you get four pages worth of questions. And it's tough to move forward on a loan without knowing what the closing document even looks like or what you're certifying to. So, we're working through all of that today as we speak. Chris, could you... Um... Is there a way you can send uh, me those updated numbers at the end of the business today? Uh, if like I get were... them, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get them. My goal over the weekend is to send every legislature an update on what's happening out there as far as branches, as far as working with individuals, businesses, and uh, municipalities to give you an update on the implementation of the PPP program. So. Uh, that is my goal this weekend to put all of that together and get it out to every legislator. Okay, is there any, we're, we're having a meeting, as you may know, at 1.30 that's going to include this issue. Uh, it's a preliminary meeting, but basically in my conversations with Representative Mark Cott, we want to know how we can help industry, th the government, other than getting out of their way, but with resources and uh, public relations, education, uh, to help this along to, so people know what's available and know that, the, and not get confused by all the different portals they can go through. So I don't know if you have any general thoughts at this point. I know it's gonna change by Monday, you know? Yeah, it's gonna change within the next hour, unfortunately. The, what I have found to be the best portal for overall resources for businesses in Vermont is what ACCD has put together right. because they're trying to incorporate everybody else's information. Uh, as far as the PPP program, if you've got businesses who are contacting you, my recommendation is you get a hold of them and they need to communicate with their borrowers ASAP. Um, we've tried to, or Treasury tried to come up with a very streamlined application right. uh, and information requirements, but for small businesses, we know that's going to be challenging. You talk, you ask a question of what we can do. Here's the reality for many of these businesses. Some will be able to take on the loans and afford to pay them back over a period of time, but we're going to have a growing number of businesses in Vermont that need an outright grant. Right. And if they can't qualify for the PPP program, or if, if the money's run out with the PPP program uh, and they can't get in, we don't have enough resources in Vermont to give grants out to the businesses. Um, the grant portion of the PPP program is the first eight weeks dealing with payroll or rent or mortgage payments. Um, and that's a, a number that people are going to have to try and put their arm, get their arms around. And that's the forgivable portion that they are going to be able to access. But again, if you can't get into the program because there's no more funding, we, the state of Vermont, do not have enough grant monies to respond to the request. I heard of a, of a figure yesterday that the anticipated $350 billion is about 5% of the estimated need across the country. Oh my God, you're kidding. I no. guess you're suggesting that that money might run out by the end of the day or the weekend or? Well, yes. I'm, I'm suggesting... Let me give myself a little bit of time, more time. I'm going to suggest that the money is probably going to be gone by early next week. Or the let me rephrase that: the drawdown on the 350 billion will be gone by early next week. 
it's then the question of what happens after that. And right. in hearing from the Treasury, they recognize that they're going to have to probably go back and put another package in front of Congress. Well, Congress, as I understand it, is out to April 20th, which means they've got to get back in session. They've got to review that package and they've got to reach agreement on it. I heard yesterday on a call that some senators across the country are reluctant to go down that road until we see what this first program looks like in the rollout. So there's so many moving pieces to this that people may have to wait two, three, four weeks before there's another pot of money that businesses may, may be able to access. It's just moving that quickly. Okay. Thank so you very I, much. Uh, let me leave you with this. Our banks are full steam ahead, taking applications, trying to get them into the SBA portal, which has already crashed several times. And our goal is to try and get as much or as many of our borrowers on that drawdown list as possible before the funds run out. Right. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. So much for the uh, promise of that program. Okay. So, uh, uh, Chair, our the Senate Rules Committee starts in about four minutes, and we are. Where would you like? What would? What do you want us uh, to do? I I would actually, Becca, could you carry our water on that and just find out um, whether if we vote this bill out on Monday. Uh, can we get it on the calendar to be talked? I mean, to I don't know whether we suspend the rules, I guess, and do everything in one day. But can we get yep. it for discussion on that? And also knowing that I will be speaking to Jane about any appropriations issues. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Thank you very I much, everybody. Up. Bye bye. Uh, Senator, are you? Hello, Senator. Excuse me. Uh, this is Faith. I just want to know if you want to end live stream. Please do.